daughter-in-law and I'm the mother of Amy is my oldest Megan and Brent and my mother is here Maybelle Howard and I'm delighted to be here it's a joy to be here and it was easy to leave everything behind to come on this trip um, that Gladys wanted to do and made possible and my mother wanted to join us and that made it a slam dunk for me and being with you as our host and hostess was very easy uh, I left behind two puppies, a ton of stress and work, and I'm not looking back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Lynn O'Prey, and I know all of them, so that's cool. Um, Dennis' husband, niece of Gladys, and I left behind my grandkids, and it is What is her name? Lissa. Lissa. Yes. Oh, the sweet tools. <laughs> oh, I love her name. Uh, I'm Kristen's husband, so son-in-law of John and Becky and grandson-in-law of Gladys. But I left behind my family. And uh, I'll miss this because it's probably the first time in a long while I haven't been. My, my dad's a minister. He's an Assemblies of God minister. And I haven't been at his Christmas Eve service. This will be the first time since who knows when. So I'll be thinking of this. Um, hi, I'm Scott Yannick. Um, my grandma is Gladys. And uh, I'm very glad to be here. I don't think I've really left anything behind besides friends in cold weather, so. Kristen, do you know I'm married to Dave and Becky and John's daughter and grandpa is my grandma. And I can assume I don't feel like I left too much behind since my whole family is here and Dave is here and my cousins are here who we usually spend the holidays with. Um, anyway, so I guess just the traditions of Christmas we left behind, but. Oh, I hope I don't cry because I cry over everything. But my, uh, I'm glad it's uh, Peterson. I was almost going to say Carlson. <laughs> but Because Aunt Gladys would be here. 
Um, my name is Brent Peterson. I'm Gladys' grandson. But not to forget Mabel's grandson. <laughs> um, and if anything I've left behind this year, I really liked the way Kristen put it, just some Christmas traditions. Um, but I also started a new job recently, so I'm actually very nervous to get back <laughs> and get to my inbox, because I know I'll have a lot to do. But that's that, and this is now. So I'm really glad to Can you tell us what you're doing with uh, I'm working for the Department of Energy on a new uh, advanced technology vehicle loan program for automakers. So it's an important time to do that. I'm Mabel Howard. I'm the mother of Cindy Peterson, who was married into the Peterson family, and I'm a travel junkie. <laughs> and I was invited to come on this trip, and I was just delighted, and it's a wonderful trip. And um, I love Gladys very much, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I'm Mike Peterson. I'm Gladys' granddaughter, and I am Greg Peterson's daughter, so that's how I'm connected to the family. Um, I left behind a new puppy that I just got, so it's hard to be away from her. Um, but I'm really happy to be here because my entire family is here. And aside from my puppy, I haven't really left anything behind. I'm just thrilled to be here. Does Tony know about this? Uh, Tony's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Tony? My boyfriend. Not the puppy. Not the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> the really important head of the I'm Dennis. I, uh, I left behind the Church of the Nativity. Uh, I had just started in August as the uh, vicar of a little church outside the Twin Cities. And uh, it happens to be the Church of the Nativity. So it's nice that I'll be at the Church of the Nativity tonight. <laughs> and uh, maybe on another pilgrimage, he'll come along. Um, I'm, really, I'm really pleased that this all came off. And you know, that you were all willing to leave these things and people and traditions behind and, and do something new. Um, it's very exciting to do this with, with family. Um, our family life together goes back 44 years, which is almost as old as Greg. Um, <laughs> actually, it goes back 50 years when I was first allowed to be part of the Carlson Christmas parties. And, uh, that's a long time. Isn't it? Is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to be back together again like this. And uh, I'll say what's on some of your minds because it's been on my heart all week long. I'm really missing Lyle today. Yep. And wishing that he were, were with us, though I suspect he has quite a good perspective on this, <laughs> this holiday. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Talk to me after that. <laughs> um, I'm Amy Peterson, one of the blessed grandkids of Gladys and Lyle. Um, what I left behind some minor work, uh, a struggling city, I guess, <laughs> could use my financial support. So I kind of am anxious for friends to get back to work because it's helping the auto industry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I guess the, the traditions. Well, this is different for all of us. I used to be on one on mail, but this, this is a great, great one. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Yannick, and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, marry Gladys and Miles' daughter, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> it's over on my lap. It's, and, uh, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. We've uh, shared certainly a lot of holidays and other times together. And, this is uh, very special to be together as a family in the Holy Lands. Very much appreciate uh, Denny and Lynette for organizing all this. And uh, you two, Yacht, yeah, very, very enjoyable to learn what we've learned so far uh, in the Holy Lands. Um, in terms of leaving things behind, work, which is a little tough the first couple of days, but after that, it's pretty easy. And <laughs> um, the other thing would be uh, my parents who, and my sister and her family who, you know, we've spent the last 50 plus years at least spending some part of the holidays with, so you know that's a little bit hard. Uh, but again, very much enjoy being here, and I'm glad to be part of it. I'm Becky Yannick, and I'm Gladys's daughter. And um, when we talked about this, I don't know how many months ago, nine, ten months ago, you know, it, things didn't run as smoothly. You know, and, and the discussions were maybe at times. Um, 
you know, challenging. Um, but Mom and I put this in God's hands. We really lifted it up. And we said, God, you do whatever you need to do to get all of us together. And however that is, we'll honor that. And I feel that all those that are here today are here for a reason. And for different reasons. And so I am really praising God for that. Because um, I think he answered our prayers. And um, I thank Mom for this. Um, we couldn't have done this without you. Um, so I hope you are honored by this and all of us being here. <laughs> We're leaving behind, like John said, and he's being too kind. I mean, he's leaving behind a couple ants that are very ill. So keep them in your prayers. Um, we work here hoping we can get through this week without a, an email. Um, but we're leaving behind our church at home, which we are very fond of and have some wonderful traditions. And so I think that's something I'm really going to miss. I'm Judith Hill, and we're interlopers on your family. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Um, but um, we got to know Lynn and Dennis through the church. And always like Lynn's attitude. <laughs> Not Dennis's. <laughs> <laughs> His becomes hers after a while. <laughs> Her <face> <laughs> and we're just thrilled to be here. Um, we have two daughters and a grandchild at home, and they're going to be just fine. They didn't think so at first, but they will. And we're just thrilled to be here. I'm Rich Hill. I'm married to Judy. And we know Dennis and Lenny through a wonderful church in San Diego, California, that Dennis built into a, an amazing place. Um, what are we leaving behind? First time away from our daughters for Christmas. It's going to be kind of, of interesting. Uh, I'm also leaving behind a personal Christmas tradition of last minute shopping, and for that, I think. <laughs> 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 we really feel privileged to be part of this pilgrimage, and even though we don't have Peterson blood, so thank you. <laughs> You'll be honorary Peterson by the time you're done. <laughs> I'd like to add something that I left behind, and it's all my warm clothes. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's, a, it's an enormous challenge for Ia, for me a little bit less, uh, but also for Israel Palestine uh, to figure out how to intersect with each of you. Because genetics notwithstanding, you all have nothing in common. We never have anything in common with others at the deepest, deepest levels. Uh, your spirituality, your, your encounter with the, the mystery of the holy in life is so completely different from your most intimate partners, from your best friend, and from the person across the hall. So, how to find the intersection uh, and and make uh, make as much meaningful experience for you as possible it is something we take pretty seriously. But we don't presume to know how to do it. Uh, what I'm going to do is suggest a a, a model for understanding faith development, and I'll get to that in a few moments, um, that I think will give you kind of a, uh, a program to plug your experience into. And it may or may not work, but it doesn't work. Can you hear anything I'm saying? I can hear you. I'm right here. Because I can speak louder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was an encouragement. Yeah, I have two hearing aids, and I still don't hear. Lynn wants me to have one. She doesn't want both ears working, she just wants one. And, and the whole idea of, of leading you for ten days through this land and, and this story and among these people it is, is to give something, or at least to offer up something rather than to take something away from it. And there's always a danger, particularly when an ultra-liberal like myself, uh, or a very ultra-liberal like Ia, gets hold of the soul, that something will feel less rather than more when it's all over. Um, and so, you know, we try very hard not to do that, because the spirit, it seems to me, can 
rest in a lot of different places, uh, even in one person, and certainly in different places among uh, a family group as large as ours. So how to give and not take away, which is to say, can we do anything, can we create any experience this week that will make your God broader rather than smaller? We are most especially not interested in uh, shrinking your God to a particular time and a particular place in this particular land. It would be a disaster if you left here thinking that you are now closer to God when you're in Jerusalem than you are close to God when you're in your own backyard or when you're among the poor or when you're doing your day's work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we ought to be severely challenged by you any time we seem to be either taking something of value away from you or, or saying something that makes your God or your journey toward God small. Everything ought to get bigger here. Uh, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a box. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, one of the things that makes our pilgrimage journey so complicated at some levels is that so many people have tried to do this before us. I mean, since probably the fourth century, when Emperor Constantine's wife got the idea of coming to the Holy Land and declaiming various things to be what they are or may not have been. Uh, but here she did that, you know, and, and created holy spots here and holy spots there, declared this, that, the other thing. And of course, religious types of all sorts, uh, scholarly and non-scholarly, jumped on board that. And, and, then, and then as early as the fourth century, the commercial interests in pilgrimage were very strong. And so people, you know, then, people like Eon now, saw a chance to make a buck. Uh, <laughs> with people who would do it, right? Well, well, in your case, uh, uh, um, and, and so that creates a layer on top of what was once reality. And then, um, centuries, centuries, more layers, and then you get the Crusaders who came to wrest this holy land, you know, from the Ottoman uh, Turks. And, uh, well, I don't know. Well, you can decide after you've been here 10 days, did they do more damage or more good? All we know is they added a few more feet to the, uh, to, to the story. And I mean feet literally. Uh, with one or two exceptions, I'll mention in a moment, uh, we will be 14 to 15, up to 20 feet above where Jesus' generation walked. Um, that, you know, church upon church, layer upon layer. Uh, you walk as archaeologists here. Uh, and you know even enough about archaeology to know that, that life lives in layers. And, uh, and by the time we uh, do the Via Dolorosa, you know, the, the way of the cross, the, the walk of tears, uh, later in the week, uh, it, it is both thrilling to have the experience of walking with Jesus to his cross, and it is at the same time sobering to realize you're 20 feet above where his feet might have been. Mm -hmm. So again, I say that not to take something away, uh, I hope actually uh, that it ultimately broadens your appreciation for holiness to realize that you don't have to be on the very stone or in the very place to be touched by the holiness, right? So, a couple of thoughts about that. Um, you know, there are a lot of holy lands. Uh, for this family, Sweden is a holy land. And so you go to Sweden and and you're trying to do what? You're trying to recapture something, yes? You're trying to get closer to something. And, um, and you don't have to be exactly there in order to get the effect, do you? Uh, it doesn't really matter whether 
one of your brutal ancestors happened to walk that way or this way <laughs> on their way to hurting my English ancestors. <laughs> uh, you know, the Vikings were all over. Damn them. About, about the talk about religious reality, spiritual reality. Spiritual reality is that which lives in you and it cannot or should not be disturbed by anyone or anything. You, you have your own relationship to the mystery that we call God. And that relationship might come to you through your, your faithful Christian life, might come to you through a personal saving relationship with Jesus, might come to you through biblical study, might not come to you at all through any of those things. Um, how you intersect your life with the divine, um, that's the spiritual. At the religious level, that is the, the attempt to organize spirituality, I'm always amused by people in my congregations say, I'm really not interested in organized religion. And I say, well, that's a good thing you're an Episcopalian then, isn't it? <laughs> organized religion. That's, a, that's an oxymoron. Um, the Bible creates much of this difficulty for us. Because the Bible is not uniform and consistent throughout. Uh, the, and particularly the stories of Jesus, because that's the divine, or the path to the divine that we're going to try to follow a bit on this pilgrimage. Uh, that story isn't coherently told. Uh, you know, I suppose, that only two of the four Gospels even mention the birth of Jesus. Yes, the other two, he just strides onto the scene, full, full blown. And, in Mark and in uh, John. Uh, John, he appears as a piece of poetry. You know, in the beginning was the word, and uh, uh, the biography, biographical detail of the man follows that, but it begins as a, as a piece of poetry. Um, <coughs> only Luke has the birth narrative that, that we're going to Bethlehem for tomorrow night. Only Matthew tells us about the wise ones coming. The other three say nothing about the wise ones coming. And Matthew does not say there were three of them. The Bible does not say there were three of them. Uh, that, and, and that they have names now. See, that belongs to somebody else. Melchior, Melchior, Belzar, Gasper. Gasper. Who said that? A. And do you know how did you know his name? Well, we're not going to have anything that precise come to us this week. Uh, and, and that's a reminder to us that not only does the, the Bible lay down layers for meant to be aids to us on our spiritual journey toward the divine. But culture has laid down a lot of stuff too. Some of it very essential, and some of it, like the names of three wise ones, that doesn't mean a lot, except it works very well in the music. Uh, you know, as the We Three Kings. Were any of you Melchior in the Three Kings procession? And John was Christmas a wise man, right? Pardon? John was a wise man, remember? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, we know because of his life. <laughs> so, uh, I'm often prone to say as, as we go to some of these places, Eon, you'll be relieved to know, does all of the teaching. I just occasionally meditate out loud. But, uh, but when I am inclined to say something about uh, the holiness of the place. I'm, I'm most likely to say something mealy mouth, like this is where the church's tradition chooses to remember that. And, and let that be enough, because it doesn't matter whether it was here or there. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of where your religious training intersects with your spiritual development, uh, 
uh, that kind of precision is not not too critical. I don't think. Uh, so Matthew, you know, gives you three chapters, five, six, and seven, on the Sermon on the Mount. And where we go to remember the Sermon on the Mount, absolutely gorgeous setting, with, with a very exciting uh, church built uh, alongside the Sea of Galilee, uh, and a hill going up to where the nuns live, I guess. Um, it doesn't take but a moment to imagine that uh, that there's a crowd there, and that Jesus is there, and the disciples are there, uh, and some of these words come ringing back to you. But by the time you get to the Gospel according to Luke, of course, they're, they're not on a hillside. They're on a plain, and we call it, you know, the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, and they aren't two identical sermons. And what that gives us cause to think is, well, maybe it wasn't all preached in one moment. It would have been a long sermon even by my standards. Um, you know, maybe as people listen to him on hillsides and on flat places, and as the collective memory gathered those those pieces of wisdom together, you wind up with a coherent sermon. But if it came from several sources, or part of it got preached here and part of it got preached there, I hope that won't affect you uh, in any negative sense. It really ought to broaden your appreciation for the scripture and, and for how scripture has come to shape our own journeys toward the divine. So, there are a couple of historic places. Lake level, of course, just like Chautauqua, changes from time to time. Chautauqua is a lake up in New York for you Pittsburgh people. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that's the lake. There, there is no doubt about that. That is the, that is the Sea of Galilee. We will be on it in a boat. It is exciting. Um, and you don't have to give away very much uh, in order to imagine, oh my goodness, this is what it was like. Because it is pretty much what it's like. The lake shore is, and it's still infested with those disgusting little fish, uh, the St. Peter's fish, you're not eating so land. It's up to them. Okay, well, uh, they're very funny little bony fish. They're a little bit like tilapia. They taste wonderful. The bones, 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 bones. And they're only about as big as a little silver dollar. It takes a lot of them. My first meal with the uh, Ia, uh, when I came here the first time, I came alone uh, to, uh, to make the tours. And Ia took me along. And we, had, we had five or six wonderful days together. We, we stayed uh, on the shore of, uh, of the lake. He said, you want fish? I said, oh, I love fish. So he went off and he was back to a bucket of fish. I'm like, how do you do all these fish? Well, we ate them all. <laughs> they don't last but a minute, do they? Yeah. Tasty though. You do the Here's the thing. I want to talk about how our faith develops. If I had a board, I would draw four concentric circles and they would look like tree rings. Because faith does not develop linearly, literally, like on an ascending uh, slope. Uh, getting closer and closer to true truth. It develops more the way a tree develops. You lay down one piece, you lay down another piece around that core, more around that, more around that, pretty soon you have a, a pretty strong you know, tree. The first, and this is a constellation of, of, of a lot of more complicated stuff that I can't understand, but most of it's based on a book by James Fowler called The Stages of Faith. And he legitimately outlines eight stages. I can't comprehend that much. We do it in four. Uh, and we think of the first, the first of the growth rings as, um, and we call it experienced faith. And it's from pre-birth until about the age of three. Don't be too fussy about the, the ages. It just ranges, okay? And the core of experienced faith is someone or something out there has the power to love me, care for me. You know, we wake up one day and we realize it was mom or dad. But far before we can realize who or what it was, we have experienced being cared for, haven't we? Unless, of course, 
you've been born into a traumatic situation, and you know what happens to a life that isn't preciously held for its first three years, yes? You know, the rest of that life is either a disaster or is spent compensating for the loss during the initial period. We, we are creatures constructed <coughs> to receive love. Therapists get rich because we block that law, but, but we're constructed to receive it. It's, it's in us, not in our genes, it's in our, it's in our fiber to, to receive love. And the first stage of faith development is that capacity to receive love, even before we can name it, even before we can get back to it. And that first smile, you know, is only a gas pain. So, you know, you, we don't give back so much. We just receive. But you, you can understand immediately how important that is to later spiritual development, can't you? Because if you can't come away from the first three years of your life with a sense of being loved, not only being loved, but being loved by someone strong to care. It has to be someone strong to care. Uh, whether it's the change in the diaper or providing food or providing physical love. We carry that with us. We recognize it from time to time when it comes back at us, this experienced faith. And it might come back to us uh, in the process of falling in love later on, when you suddenly feel yourself receiving uh, uh, that, that strong care. From, it, from outside yourself. It might come back uh, on a magnificent winter or summer's day in a natural setting when all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, and you mean, oh my God, oh my God. This is such an incredible world, such an incredible creation, such an incredible feeling of warmth and goodness and love, and a sense of security comes with it, comes toward me in this setting. So, you know, the romantic poets go off in one direction with this, and scientists go off in another direction, and uh, it's all kind of pre-conscious, and not particularly rational, and doesn't have a lot of words that go with it. But you know it when you have it, and you weep when you don't. Second stage, the affiliative stage of faith development. And the affiliative stage runs from uh, age 3 to about 10, maybe 12, this is the stage in which you begin, or you are affiliated with, a believing community. Now obviously if you're not raised in a church-going family, there's a separate track for this. Uh, and we're, we'll just go down the church, churchly track. So churches arise within a hundred years of Jesus' life. Uh, and, um, and they become communities that are defined by a certain faith, statements, creeds. They're defined by uh, certain liturgical or worship practices. They're defined by certain community values. We will care for one another, we will care for the world around, blah, 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 blah. In the affiliative stage, uh, we, get, we, we gain our sense of belonging uh, to a community. Now it's not something external that loves us, it's community that loves us, cares for us. The church communicates uh, its affection for us in various ways. It is uh, the affiliative stage of, of our faith development is a time when um, we put on uh, the, the mantle of, of religion. Uh, we, we don't invent it ourselves. We, we, we take into ourselves uh, what the Bible tells us, you know. Jesus tells me this I know, or the Bible tells me so. Uh, and that community uh, sets the rules for us, rules of behavior when we are within the community, rules of personal behavior when we're outside the community. You know, this is how you shall act, this is how you shall not act. Uh, and it's a time when we come to feel important. The affiliative community makes us feel important as faithful people. And so we get little jobs to do. Growing up in the church, I wash dishes for endless potluck suppers, you know. And then I was an altar boy, you know, and then this and then that, and you've all had similar experiences. 
and you both sit at the feet of Sunday school teachers and as you mature in years you probably then become an assistant in the Sunday school or in some other way you begin to feed back into the community something in gratitude for this gift. Yeah, Santa Lucia counts as that. Santa Lucia? Yeah. Two <laughs> more <laughs> Santa Lucia. <laughs> I was a two two. Uh, yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Being in the pageant, being in the pageant is uh, is probably the most important feeling a kid has in, in the early years of thinking about it. But yeah, that's good. You should have done good, friend. Well then, then lo and behold what happens, uh, mid-teens, and there's really no end date on this. We enter a stage we call the searching phase of, of our faith development. It is not faithlessness, but it's a time when you no longer rely on the, uh, the comforting arms of the affiliates of the community that has been raising you and, and supporting you in your, in your faith and spiritual development. Uh, it might be a time of severe questioning. You might really become quite agnostic about it all. Uh, you might at least wonder if the Baptist really had it right, or is it possible that the Methodists had some corner on all of this? And then you realize, oh my goodness, no, it's the Episcopalians, they have it. Yes. And, uh, and, and during, during the searching, it can be a search across denominations, but of course it can also be a search outside the faith. Suddenly you realize, you know, in your teen years, when they get to certain lines in the creed, you fall silent because it's just not in you to say those words anymore. And, uh, and so it often leads folks, and this coincides sort of with intellectual studies in high school and college, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it comes when you, your intellect leads you out beyond where you're affiliated with faith and culture. It's perfectly natural, perfectly appropriate. Some denominations of Christianity support the search better than others. For some, to go searching is to be apostate. It's to actually give up the faith. A lot of scoldings around all of this. Uh, some, the Amish, have this smart thing, what do they call it? They've got that funny name for it. Uh, when they actually send you out of the community for a year. Come on, well, you know. The it sounds like Rumpel Stiltskin, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. Anyway, it's, they're sent out into the world to see what it's like and then the hope is they'll choose back into the affiliative community. But that search, of course, scrambles some of their brains and, and they, they kind of fly off the edge rather than return. No, it's a very exciting time. Um, and as I say, some denominations, Episcopal Church is one of them, but sort of encourage the search. You know, you, you can't ask a blasphemous question in the Episcopal Church. Uh, God knows it might be good if you could, but we, I mean, there are no limits, and so we ask about everything. Others, uh, much, much tighter. Catholics are not encouraged to, to think very far outside the teachings of their church. Uh, and if they think too far outside, uh, even as intellectuals and theologians, uh, like Pierre uh, uh, Char de Chardin, uh, they can get in a lot of trouble. Uh, or the Jesuits, you know, who were put on hold for, what, a generation or two by the Pope for, for their intellectual and theological explorations. Each denomination does this differently. Do you know how many denominations there are, speaking of the Christian pie? More than 30,000. Wow. Not congregations, denominations. We have sliced the pie of Christian faith. We're not talking now about Muslims and Jews and others. We've sliced that pie into 30,000 quite thin slices. This is either a source of continuous scandal in heaven or enormous abuse. <laughs> I mean toward the latter. I, I would too. Um, and, and the search goes on. And the, the search uh, is meant ultimately not necessarily to lead you back to the affiliated community which nurtured your faith, but it is meant to lead you back to something you're willing to own. And that's the fourth stage, owned faith. Experience, affiliative, searching, owned. Old faith is, is kind of a play on words. Uh, it is true. You decide to own this faith. I, I've thought it through. I've looked it through. I've had experiences, and this is where I stand. Oh, Martin Luther, sort of. Um, 
but it but it it also means I am now willing to be owned by faith. And that's sort of exciting to realize that you're now you've now found a faith stance that you're going to allow to take you over, and you are going to be in discipline to it. And um, and then. The, let me not give the impression that that's the end of a journey. It's, it's not enough because you could go from a position of own faith, you could have a traumatic moment, you could have this and the other thing. I mean, I think of the number of, uh, of Roman Catholic women who, who certainly owned and were owned by their faith and then uh, against any thought that it could ever happen to them, they wind up needing or choosing to have an abortion. And the faith that owned them now disowns them. I, I say this only a little criticism, but it, the faith cannot follow them on their on their life's journey, and and then they're in trouble. And some women, still owned by the faith, go to the Catholic Church the rest of their lives and never receive communion again because they they you know they've done something for which the church cannot help them find their way back. Uh, so. Such a person uh, who's been in a position of ownership of faith might come back into a searching phase. What we find uh, happens almost as often is folks get out sort of out on a limb uh, um, spiritually, out just a little bit beyond where they belong. I, I think of myself that way sometimes. And they, they jump back into the affiliative. And so very often folks will do the life's journey have quite an exciting religious and spiritual journey, and then come right back to something that's, that's truly at home. And what they find there are friends and relatives who never left home. And, and, and that journey is, is, is complete, and, and they kind of live it out at the affiliative stage. Others continue seeking all the time, not necessarily a restless, empty seeking, but just just always open. I, I feel that way. I, I have been as interested in cosmology as I have been in the gospel story. Uh, I don't equate them, but I, as, in terms of intellectual interest, my God has become enormous as I have come to understand more about the natures and origins of the creation. Uh, the God I, of creation that I used to adore uh, did a very small job. <laughs> uh, I realize now the God of this creation did quite an enormous job. And I find that enormously exciting and very expansive. And so you think a lot of it's how we're wired, our personalities. Um, some people probably go through these things very uneventful. Yes. These stages, and that's just who they are. Absolutely. And some, they, they just because of the way they're wired, they're going to fight it. And it doesn't mean one is any better than the other. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and it's good you say that. And what's interesting, of course, is it is there are different drivers in this. Uh, not everybody who's uh, uh, searching, um, not everybody who goes beyond the affiliative is searching out of an intellectual hunger uh, or distraction. Sometimes uh, there are intellectual distractions to faith. Uh, they, they, may, they may simply be driven by new experiences, a new experience of faith, a, a core experience just drives them deeper in their hunger, and they, they need more and more to be fed. Um, some never leave the affiliative stage. They, they, they enter it as children. It makes sense to them at every level, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual. They, they cling to it, and, and they never leave. And, and again, there, there's no criticism. This, this thing about own faith is not as though, oh, now you've won the game. Uh, that would be crazy to say that. There's only to say this tree has lots of rings. And different times in your life, you might be in one ring or you might go back to another. You know, I, I you know, during the height of my, my professional ministry career, I, I would annually go on a retreat, sometimes eight silent days, once 30 silent days, uh, following the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And and those would be core moments of experience. I mean, that's when Jesus came off the pages of the Bible and into my heart. It wasn't, wasn't through Sunday school after all. And it wasn't directly from the Bible. It was through this 
this core experience was irresistible to me. I, I simply knew you know, that, that this, this being uh, existed for me, for others too, but for me. Anyway, now, with that thought in mind, two closing quick thoughts. Um, why we go on pilgrimage? Uh, and then you can think about this, you can think about where this lands on you, and you can think about how it might affect one person at one stage of faith development, and another person quite differently who's at a different stage of faith development. That's why you're all going to have different experiences, even though they're going to be at the same places. Okay? And, and that's why if you have enough intimacy to share it either with your bed partner or, or with your sibling uh, or, or with your parent or with your child or we with each other, it would be very exciting, but we don't push toward that. But that intimacy of, oh, this is what happened to me, very exciting. Sometimes we do it just to get close to the holy, you know. Uh, like that trip to Sweden, my first trip to England, I thought, oh my goodness, I really am English, you know. I was in search of my grandpa's grave, uh, not his grave, his birthplace. Went to the church where he used to pump the bellows for the big organ. Amazing, amazing. And, I, and as Lynn and I left our first trip together to England, I said, there is something here. It's just, man, it's here. You know, I know it. Uh, here's another way. I just, I, I picked up in London, the uh, night before last, this new book by Bill Bryson. Do you know Bryson? Oh, I do. I just read that book. Did you? Yeah. I just finished it right before. I just I finished it this morning. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's a great book. I, Lynn and I are Shakespeare nuts, and we, I've read a lot, a lot of stuff. It's very helpful. But he's also, you know, the walk in the woods man, and uh, <laughs> history is nearly everything. Yeah. It's a great writer. He says this, and now think about Oscar and the Holy Land. But what must it have been like when they, the plays, were brand new? When all their references were timely and sharply apt? And all the words never before heard? Imagine what it must have been like to watch Macbeth without knowing the outcome. To be part of a hushed audience hearing Hamlet's, Hamlet's soliloquy for the first time. To witness Shakespeare speaking his own lines. There cannot have been anywhere in history many more favored places than these. Well, so part of pilgrimage is trying to get to that core, to have that sense of it, eternal refreshment. Uh, we're here. Um, and that's why I said the precision about the spot is not so in, in, important. Sermon on the Mount here, Sermon on the Plain there, this, that, that. Let's choose to remember it here. There are a couple of places that are real. The shore and the Roman steps that we may get a chance to see coming up out of the valley uh, next to the old city. And that's good. How am I doing on time? I'm doing good on time. Don't you know? and, uh, <laughs> And there, so there are a couple of places you can put your foot and say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe other feet have been here before me, you know, maybe his feet have been here, maybe. Uh, but you can't do that in old city Jerusalem because you're 20 feet too high. The second kind of pilgrimage is one of obedience. Uh, the, the really crazy pilgrims used to do various parts of this, of course, on their knees. This was very hard work. Uh, they did this to the point of pain on purpose to prove their, their radical obedience and to share in some way the suffering of Christ. We're not going to do that. Uh, but I understand what that means to us. It means I want to be a faithful disciple. This is where the disciples follow this man. I want to follow this man. Or, I have been following this man. I want to be confirmed and strengthened in my following of this man. And when I'm at this particular shore, I, 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 I get a sense <laughs> that is different from the good feeling I get on the, on the shores of the uh, Weedy Lake Chautauqua. The third reason one might go is just out of curiosity. Just as an open seeker, uh, we encourage that rather than coming with predispositions. Um, come as skeptics even. I don't know what this stuff. 
That's okay. What we ask, though, is that you be willing to be moved. You don't have to be moved. <laughs> be willing to be moved. Uh, that kind of openness uh, might take you directly to heaven. Come as a learner. For nothing of a religious sort at all, this is an enormously interesting land. I mean, the history itself. I wake up at 5 to 7, very I'm going to beat all of you to the table. There he is. He's already reading the history of Israel and Palestine. Uh, <laughs> you know who we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Iyad, Iyad is full of this stuff. I mean, uh, it, it, you will just, there is such a deep appreciation to be cultivated, not just for the historical, but for the, the enormously complicated flow uh, of uh, political social activity now. And, and our lecturers will be helping you uh, appreciate some of those themes. Uh, and then finally, uh, the more I come, uh, the more I come to be with the living stones. You know, this is one of my living stones, my favorite one, but you're, you're going to meet others, uh, my Palestinian cousins up in, up in the Galilee. Um, the percent of Christians in the Holy Land now is what? Less than 2%. Less than 2 of the people in the land we call Holy are Christians. Once it was as high as 33 to 40 percent, you know, in that kind of way. Uh, Two percent. Uh, these living stones, these living witnesses to our faith tradition, they need support, they need love, they need encouragement to stay. Uh, they need to know they are not alone in their witness. They need to know if they make sacrifices here, to be Christian witnesses in this place, they'd like to know we're making sacrifices there to be witnesses where we are. Uh, they like uh, to have a sense of solidarity. Uh, to my mind, they deserve it and earn it, though it's theirs by great sight. And you'll see when we meet these people and when you feel their uh, APH, aggressive Palestinian hospitality, uh, that you, you'll, you'll understand that the living stones are, are in the end uh, as uh, I won't say more important, I'll just say they are as important uh, as any other stone you're going to see or walk on. So lots of, lots of levels to pilgrimage are, as there are lots of levels to the land. Questions, comments, additions, corrections? Uh, on the history, you just say, I, you saw me this morning, and I was focusing in on the end of World War I, the Ottoman Turks, the English, the Mandate, and I just as Becky and I were walking around <laughs> looking for Gladys's plaque, which we now know doesn't exist. But in your chapel here is a coat of arms, a coat of arms which was delivered to this chapel by the British government as they were leaving in 1948. So the termination of the Balfour Declaration, which I was reading about this morning, that symbolic coat of arms is in your chapel. It's here. I just, I said, wow, this is way incredible. Because, I'll just add one more thing, is Cindy and I met folks in Germany whose parents were part of the whole exodus. The, da the daughter of the guy portrayed in the book by Leon Uris, portrayed by Paul Newman in the movie Exodus, we may get a chance to see here. But that whole idea of what was going on in Cyprus, what was going on here, and the whole ultimately departure of the British concludes, at least symbolically, ends up in your chapel, which we'll be gathering together on Christmas Eve. And I'm thinking, this is way too serendipitous, way to whatever. So from a historical, perhaps a religious perspective, I was moved early this morning to read this and moved just before we gathered here today. As always, Rachel, you have the first. Yes. <laughs> moving experience, the experience ever. <laughs> it, was, it was spooky, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, you will add to that now, uh, you know, so here's the relic of the British 
mandate. You'll learn more about this uh, when he yeah, does a talk later and when some of the others lecture us. Um, but anyway, so here's the, the relic of the mandate that created the chaos in, in the land lost holy. Uh, as as the, the Brits gave the Palestinian people's land to the Jews so that they could have their land again, which was never their land because it was always everybody's land, you know. Anyway, you will also now be meeting people who are the children, uh, well, not just the children, you will be meeting people who on that fateful night in 1948 heard a knock on the door, answered the door, were driven from their homes into refugee camps. You will go to a refugee camp <coughs> and still living in it since 1948 uh, while, while Jewish people live in the homes that have been theirs for generations. Sewing and you will understand, pardon? Sewing on their sewing machines. Yeah, sewing on their sewing machines. And, um, and that's kind of sober. Uh, whose land is it? Well, the ten days, it's our land, by God. I mean it literally. For ten days, it's ours. Are you going to take us out into it, huh? Yep. Okay.